Yesterday, the US CPI comes in and restarts the inflation debate. Today, China's CPI comes in and effectively ends it. Chinese consumer prices in the month of March fell by 1%, which was the third largest monthly decline in the last 20 years. Also, producer prices in China continue to decline in spite of surging oil prices. And if that wasn't enough, on top of everything, China's currency continues its ongoing struggle and drama. So we'll talk about why that matters, and also in the same context of consumer prices globally. Because that's what it's all about, the global environment. China's consumer and especially producer prices tell us more about the direction of the global environment than anything in anywhere else. So pay closer attention to those and producer prices more generally. So we're gonna start with China's consumer prices and then we'll go over the producer prices and Yuan saga before we end with a couple of examples that show you exactly why it's a good idea to watch all of these even if you're not in China. So Chinese consumer prices, as I just mentioned, they fell by a sharp 1% in the month of March alone. And that's after having risen by 1% in February. And when consumer prices increased in February, there was a lot of mainstream chatter about, okay, more confirmation that China's economy has turned a corner. The government stimulus is actively working here. And here's the proof for it, or part of the proof for it. But, if, you're not, if you don't pay close enough attention to the Chinese economy, you may not realize that Chinese consumer prices always increase in the month of February. Well, not always February, sometimes it's January, but it all ties into the spring festival in New Year. During that holiday, the golden week, when the economy is shut down, the country shut down for an entire week, Chinese consumers travel and they spend, and oftentimes they spend a lot, and it has a very big impact on consumer prices. So when consumer prices increased in February, that wasn't something to get excited about. That was just confirmation of the usual typical seasonal behavior. However, what happens in March can tell us a lot about whether or not that splurge carries over or if it is a sign of potentially consumers going too far. And in the month of March, 2024, the numbers that just came out last night, a decline of 1% is the third worst decline over the last 20 years, monthly declines in the CPI. And the other two, of course, happen to be March. We're talking about March of 2020 and March of 2018, not good comparisons to begin with. So what that suggests, strongly suggests, is that consumers, after exhausting themselves in the holiday period, are now back to even worse than their typical pattern, which is to cut back once the holiday's over and they get back to normal. In this new normal environment in China, that means weakness. And the consumer price number that just came out suggests even more weakness than has become normal. Food prices were responsible for the degree of the decline. Those had fallen 3.2% in March, but it wasn't just food. In fact, it was the, the entire variety in the consumer price bucket. Non-food prices were down half a percent, which was pretty sharply. Consumer goods overall down nine tenths of a percent on the month. That's not a good sign either. And China's core CPI, such that there is one, the index excluding food and energy fell by six tenths of a percent. And as a result of everything, the year-over-year -year rate was just barely positive at one-tenth of a percent, another exceptionally low number, which is fitting given the circumstances that these consumer prices in China are actually indicating. Nothing good there. Over on the producer side, producer prices were down one-tenth of a percent in March, which is the fifth consecutive monthly decline. And that's despite oil prices. The last time the producer price index or the factory gate price index in China had increased was last August and September. If you remember last August and September, that was the last oil price spike. And here we have another one of those that is approaching the same degree and level as last fall, and it isn't even making a dent in China's producer prices. The PPI, as I said, down one-tenth of a percent, and means of living prices, which are basically consumer goods and things like that, also down one-tenth of one percent in, month, in the month of March. So it is concerning that we see the producer price numbers continue to be negative 
on a monthly and annual basis, even though petroleum, energy, gasoline, everything like that is going up and going up sharply. In terms of the factory gate prices, which you can actually see this really well, and factory gate prices are the raw materials that are coming into the gate of the factory, whereas the PPI is focused on prices leaving the factory. But at the factory gate price index, that was also down one tenth of a, one -tenth of a percent in the month of March. It's despite a seven tenths of a percent increase, monthly increase in fuel and power. That was more than balanced out by the 1.6% decline in ferrous metal materials, which is something I keep talking about on this channel, iron and steel prices. Those are big clues about the, the situation in China. Even building materials down six tenths of a percent, despite the government's best efforts to stabilize the housing market, the property sector, to support developers so that they at least finish the projects that they've started. Instead, we, still, we continue to see deflationary developments all throughout the Chinese economy. And that's the biggest takeaway from both consumer as well as producer prices, at least in the local Chinese context, that the Chinese government stimulus, both monetary as well as fiscal spending, they're not producing the results that everyone hopes to see, especially in the government. Instead, if anything, we're getting more hints now that we're on the other side of the New Year's Spring Festival that the situation might have, been, might have actually deteriorated even more. And it's these indications in China's producer prices that bring us to the global factors. As bad as it is in the local area in China and local economy in China, China's PPI in particular, the year-over-year -year change, which was again negative in March and even more negative in March than February, that corresponds to a whole range of global statistics, including other price indexes, as I've shown before in yesterday's video, as well as some others you might not expect. For example, China's PPI lines up really well with something like U.S. wholesale sales. Because what we're really talking about here in these global factors, it isn't that China's PPI or producer prices or China in any fashion is directly impacting U.S. consumer prices. When we talk about global, the global environment, what we mean is that all of these global factors, especially in these euro dollar cycles, that tend to have an impact first and foremost in China will eventually have the same impact in other places around the world, amplified to an extent by the feedback effects from, from those impacts on China. So when China's producer prices line up really well with U.S. wholesale sales, what that's saying is that it's not China is directly affecting U.S. economy, is that there are a common set of global factors impacting both, and in this case, in almost the same time. That's because China is still, to this day, a critical part of the global economic framework. One of the most direct ways that that happens, though, the most big, the largest impact tends to be in crude oil. China is a huge importer, the world's biggest importer of crude oil. So if there's weakness in the Chinese economy that's indicated by both consumer and producer prices over there, there will be a direct link between that weakness, which is itself a product of these global factors, and believe it or not, consumer price numbers around the world. Because if China stops buying as much oil, stops importing as much oil, oil prices tend to be weak, which means a direct disinflationary impact on consumer price numbers around everywhere else. And that's what we saw exactly last year. Chinese imports of crude oil were rising from around the beginning of the year and reopening as China started to restock after the previous year. It, but it, it only got up until around October. In the last few months of last year, China's imports of crude oil started to fall off precipitously. Pretty substantial decline. And what did oil prices do? Oil prices immediately started to fall off and bond yields fell too. As disinflation directly from Chinese economic behavior started to show up more and more around the world too because it's all linked in that way to oil prices. So the producer prices, again, and consumer price numbers that we see tell us about global factors and weakness that's, that's impacting China. And there are even direct, direct relationships with that in consumer price numbers. But it goes much, much deeper and much, much more. It is much, much more profound than just the direct link between oil, China, and CPIs. One critical indication about these global factors, China's yuan. 
and it's still an ongoing struggle a week later. I did a video last week on all the background details and how it got to this point. So check that out if you want to see uh, exactly how, what, 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 what the details are, everything behind what we're going to talk about here. Where we left off was we expected that eventually the PBOC would have to back down because the currency would continue to be weaker. And that's just what happened. On Monday, the PBOC did fix a little bit, a little tiny bit stronger. But ever since then, they've been fixing slightly weaker and slightly weaker and slightly weaker. But after the PPI and CPI numbers came out last night, CNY dropped all over again. And at just the last check before I started recording here, the exchange value was 723.74. And given the PBOC's fix last night at 709.68, that puts the 2% daily limit at 723.87. That means we're just 13 pips away from the 2% limit which is almost as close as it had been last Wednesday when this whole mess started. So what you can, what all this tells us is that the PBOC is getting a little bit more nervous that the currency wants to go down because CNY does want to go lower. It keeps trying to move lower. Despite the, the, uh, the appearance and intervention of commercial banks in China intervening by selling dollars, really meaning supplying dollars to the marketplace, it's still weakening, weakening, weakening. And the PBOC is recognizing that by fixing slightly, slightly less. They're backing down slowly, but perceptibly. But that just leaves the currency in the same state that it was last week. This ongoing drama where if the 2% limit is actually breached, that could represent something substantial. But either way, it's another warning sign about the situation in China as it pertains to this global environment. I promised a couple examples where it paid to pay more attention to China's uh, producer and consumer price, its price numbers, than, say, the rhetoric in the West about inflation, heating up, labor shortages, and all the stuff that you hear frequently. And that includes the last time we went through this before the supply shock in the 2020s. That was 2018. Now, I just talked about this, too, in a recent video, if you want the background about consumer prices. But there was an inflation scare late 2017 into early 2018. The core consumer price number in the United States was moving up very quickly. In fact, the rolling three-month rate got up to 3.1%. The rolling three-month rate in the overall CPI got to 3.7% by February 2018. And as I said, it was a major inflation scare. Janet Yellen turned over to Jay Powell and said, you need to be hawkish because labor shortage, globally synchronized growth, all of these positive factors, consumer prices are going to be a huge issue for 2018 and into 2019. But already, you look over in China, and the situation had already reversed. China's PPI had peaked way back in October of 2017. The year-over-year -year rate was at 6.9%. And the PPI month-over-month -month had peaked in September of 2017 at a 1% rate. By February of 2018, as all of these things are really starting to come out, including in the currency, the PPI was down in February 2018 when CNY stopped rising. Then it was down a little bit more in March and April in the aftermath of the Golden Week and all the other stuff that was erupting, erupting at the time. And that's when CNY really started to fall in reverse from there on. China's CPI, as I mentioned in the intro, March 2018 was one of the worst months in the last 20 years for consumer prices. That had been up 1.2% in February 2018 with the Spring Festival, which was later in the month that year. And then March of 2018, the month after the Spring Festival, down 1.1%. And all of this was blamed on trade wars and everything else that went along with that tariffs, uh, lack of more conflict in the trade environment, when in fact this was another euro dollar cycle, global factors captured by China's producer prices and the behavior of its currency. And more and more as 2018 went on, the world more and more resembled those and not the red hot recovery, labor shortage, inflation rhetoric that you heard around the rest of the world. And more financial indicators went along with that too. One final example, just to really put an emphasis on this, 2014 in 2015, euro dollar number three. Back then we had the same thing as 2018, though not quite as, as emphatic. The, the idea was that QEs three and four had finally done the, done the job that they were supposed to do. They created a recovery, a legitimate recovery, one that was going to be inflationary. The unemployment rate in the US dropped, which 
reduce the amount of perceived slack in the economy perceived by uh, central bankers and economists, which meant that there was going to be an inflation outbreak in 2014, especially 2015. So the Fed had to hurry up and wrap, wrap up those QEs and get on with the rate hikes. But already there was trouble in 2013 and into 2014. China's currency turned around in 2014, right from the start of 2014. Uh, producer prices also had been weak heading into 2014. But all of that really started to, to, to materialize with the oil price shock in, in, later ha in the latter half of 2014. We saw that in, in Chinese producer prices. China's demand never kept up with expectation. In fact, it started to fall off, which meant that with rising U.S. supply, oil prices absolutely crashed. With consumer prices never really accelerated, in large part because oil prices were down. And oil prices were down because global factors that were especially impacting China the most. So consumer prices on the whole, there are some idiosyncrasies and variations in both the short run and, and across geographies, but consumer prices on the whole are dictated by these global factors, the global environment. And China can tell us a lot about the state of the global environment in various ways. Consumer prices, especially producer prices and how well they correlate, and maybe most of all, the direction of the currency. And again, it's not that China is directly impacting uh, the situation in the economies throughout the West. It's that China is exhibiting the symptoms of the set of global factors that will impact the rest of the global economy. There are some direct links like through crude oil, but overall it's the direction of the global system, the global environment. And we can see that in China's currency as well. So what does, this, what does all of this mean for 2024? Well, given the restarted inflation debate on consumer prices, the idea that U.S. consumer prices are stuck, what China is suggesting is that they are not stuck. They're in a temporary space where oil prices are having impact, shelter prices too, and some other things. But the global environment and those global factors are exceptionally weak. We see that in Chinese consumer prices as well as ongoing deflation in producer prices. And you add to that the struggles with the currency, it continues to want to go down. And all of it in the face of a government stimulus that is not having an impact, meaning these are really substantial headwinds that we're seeing in China's economy, therefore global factors as well. The inflation debate remains settled. U.S. consumer prices are experiencing another short-run spasm, as they do quite frequently. But the overall cycle, the overall worldwide environment, globally synchronized, pay attention to what we're seeing in China, not to what everyone is saying about a rerun of 1973. If you do want the full details surrounding the struggle between the PBOC, China's currency, these daily limits, and everything else, and why it really matters videos linked below. As always, I thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and subscribers. And until next time, take care.